just avails not. And you know, if there were ever a poet who proved that, who can speak to us across time and across space, I think this is the one. Can you hear me okay? Your volume good? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, this is Ned, by the way, who uh, is very uh, much interested in intruding himself into my interactions with others. And so he's going to you know, make a little claim on me and say hello to you along the way, too. But I think he will behave if his panting gets out of hand. Um, let, me, let us know, and I'll quiet him down. So um, to begin to talk about Walt Whitman, um, I read Whitman first in high school when I was, I was discovering poetry, finding poetry for myself and falling in love with it. And I, I knew there were beautiful lines there, extraordinary images, but I, I, there was a barrier between myself and Whitman in that he was presented as a nationalist poet and as a patriot. I was a child of the late 60s. I was not interested in nationalism or patriotism. Those things were, were not available to me. And so I, I didn't quite know how to approach his work. And then in my very first teaching job, I was a sabbatical replacement for an American-led professor who was on leave uh, at Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa. He had already prepared the reading list for his survey course in American literature, and the first text was Song of Myself. So there I was teaching a 65-page poem to a group of young people who were taking a class because it met a humanities requirement. They were not especially interested in poetry. And for me, that time of reading the poem closely being prepared to talk about it other people was a revelation. I had no idea what was there. How daring, how brave, how capacious that poem was, how unlike anything else. And so thus began um, a long love affair, a, a very extended one. Uh, now, about 15, 20 years ago, I wrote a few essays about Whitman uh, for various occasions. And uh, after I'd done two or three of those, a friend said, oh, you're writing a book about Whitman. And I thought, yeah, I am, but I didn't, I hadn't known that. And I didn't know what the book would be, because if you're going to pick a writer about whom a great deal of ink has been spilled, you couldn't do much better than to go to Walt Whitman. Reams and reams of criticism, biography, uh, social commentary, people are always discovering new aspects of his life, or even finding new, new works of his. Uh, it's only in the last few years that a grooming manual for men that Whitman composed has been discovered in a, you know, some uh, small town newspaper which survived only in one copy and there it was. So what could I say about Whitman? What could I add to that? And I, I had the profound sense that I could, but I didn't know how. A sense that my own engagement with those poems was something to be cherished, to be attended to, and might um, open some doors for other readers as well. So I began to write about Whitman, and I have never worked so long and hard on a book in my life, uh, many years of writing. I wrote first a long, unwieldy, lumpish book, which was kind of like climbing Mount Walls. I, I had to get a sense of the shape of the whole. And then I looked at it, and I thought, no one will want to read this. Where do I find the through line, the direction? It took a long time, and I, I began to understand that what I was doing was going looking for him, that I wanted to keep company with a person I felt so profoundly behind these words, who tells us again and again that he is right behind the words. He wants to reach us and touch us. He says, you know, I, I, I'm weary of the cold tide and the ink between us. I want contact. He says, whoever touches this book touches a man. He says, stop with me this day and night, and you shall have the secret. You shall possess the secret of all poems. He says, I stop somewhere waiting for you. So there's a remarkable sense of always reaching to include us, to hold us, and bring us uh, face to face with him through the text. So the book finally became a way of talking back to him and of trying to see how these poems came into being. When Whitman was a younger man, he was a bookseller, a carpenter, an itinerant school teacher. He had a third grade education in the Brooklyn public schools, which meant simply that he recited back uh, statements that the teachers made as they were in their text, and the whole class would recite these chorally. He did that for three years, dropped out of school, was apprenticed to a printer and journalist, which was a common combination of the time, and learned to trade. He produced, before he was 35, a kind of corny temperance novel, a uh, detective story, some rather sentimental poems, um, and various newspaper articles, there is nothing, nothing to make you think that this man 
was going to write some of the greatest American poems, not only of the century, but ever. Some of the poems that people are reading around the world right now in every language into which poetry is translated, that he would reinvent American poetry in terms of style and form, that he would write the first same, direct same-sex love poems in English since the Renaissance, and what else? Um, that he would um, be a poet that we just simply cannot stop reading. So how did that happen? What were the sources of that work? And one of the things I've tried to do in the book is to talk about um, where these poems came from. What, how could they have been made? And I, I want to read you just a handful of pages here. What is the grass, by the way? This is a beautiful cover from uh, the photographer Dwayne Michaels, that I'm enormously proud of. He's one of the uh, earliest of out gay photographers in the 1970s. He's the first person to put stories, handwritten stories, at the base of his photographs. And he's still kicking. Dwayne is uh, in his 80s, and he's a marvel. Uh, and I'll show you, too. This is the British edition of the book. And it's so interesting to see them together because it seems to me the British edition has a kind of British accent, basically. It's quite a different more um, bookish kind of tone to it. I think it's also quite beautiful. So here we go. The author of these pages had a third grade education. If the endless recitation of drills that comprised Brooklyn public schooling in the 1830s can be called that. At 11, the age around which many boys of his era began to work and learn a trade, he apprenticed to a printer. In the years before the publication of his book, he'd work as a printer and journalist to common co a common combination at the time an itinerant school teacher in small Long Island towns, a bookseller, a carpenter, a builder of houses, had he died before that curious, oversized first edition of Leaves of Grass was published, it's unlikely we'd ever have heard his name. You think something in the early work of Walt Whitman would suggest the intelligence and scope, the sly wit and visionary luminosity of the pages stacked and wrapped in his ribbon portfolio. When he made his agreement with the printer Andrew Rome, he was 35, and his publication consisted of a handful of regrettable poems and a larger quantity of windy prose, editorial pieces, melodramatic short stories, and urban mystery serialized in newspapers, and a crochet of yeah. But there's nothing at all to make us suspect that this man will write a decent poem, much less reinvent American poetry. He would pay to publish his book, write many of the stories, write many of the reviews of it himself, sell perhaps, in fact, if in fact any copies, and then go right on to publish a second edition. Who would have thought that it would be a book that we have never stopped reading? One that would be translated into every language in which poetry might be read, a book people scattered around the globe are holding at the moment you read this page. One he never finished writing, but simply revised and expanded until it was stretched some 30 years later into a lumpen thing, almost beyond recognition, a book of presumption and daring, expansiveness and wild ambition, one with a few antecedents, yes, but nonetheless startlingly original, unlike anything that had been written before. Where on earth did it come from? Where on earth did it come from? You can ask that question of any poem, and one inevitable answer is, as, is a simple one, work. No mad thing springs up unbidden, even those that seem to. The poem that announced itself to the intoxicated Coleridge before a knock at the door banished most of it from his memory, or the composition that sprung full-blown into the head of Mozart as he stepped down from a carriage after a satisfying dinner, seemed to pour from the artist's hand, so long school those hands had become, but years of labor informed those spontaneous productions. Though a poem over which one struggles may seem labored or often prepares the way for new writing in which what's been learned emerges with an effortless grace. In the end though, work accounts for a poem of genius about as much as plumbing accounts for the fountains of Rome. It yields a necessary basis, the practical scaffolding that underlies the whole, but it cannot in itself engender a sense of transport. To shift the figure from water to another element, labor may give a poem a ruddy glow, but no amount of it will set the page on fire. The great poems of Leaves of Grass are spectacularly, uniquely on fire. There are, I admit, only a handful of them, although one is long enough that you can wander in it like a labyrinth, uncertain of where you're headed, but gradually, undeniably arriving someplace entirely new. 
The brilliant mid-century American poet and critic Randall Jarrell wrote that a good poet is someone who manages in a lifetime of standing out in thunderstorms to be struck by lightning five or six times, a dozen or two dozen times, and he is great. Who besides Shakespeare might have been struck two dozen times, I cannot say. Even in the life work of many of our, gen of our greatest poets, a few dazzling electrical flashes are brighter than all the rest. We think no less of John Keats because he didn't write more of those odes, or of Elizabeth Bishop because Geography 3 isn't longer. What daring heat and light Whitman's masterworks emit. They proceed with absolute confidence to make the wildest claims, inventing a cosmogony, a theology, a stance toward reality. They burn with evangelical urgency yet insist that no one requires a spiritual teacher. They find the basis for a social compact in the common bedrock of the desiring human body and sing the inclusive, generous, common self in a mode so formally inventive that its first readers must have wondered if these were poems at all. But the combination of unbridled content and unfamiliar form seems to have left even writers of considerable acumen in the dust. Emily Dickinson is said to have taken a peek inside the book and firmly closed it. I don't believe that personally, but that's, that's the rumor. Henry James noted with devastating simplicity, this will not do. I would like to think that writers of such genius, whatever they may have said, recognized as kin the astonishing outpouring of work that appeared from the hand of a self-proclaimed rough from Brooklyn, but there is no evidence that they did. There is barely, there is surely an uncomfortable sort of admiration and kinship expressed in a letter from the great tormented Jesuit poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, though. I always knew in my heart Walt Whitman's mind to be more like my own than any other man's living. As he is a very great scoundrel, this is no pleasant confession. So, um, the method of this book, because I didn't want to write a biography, there's a very great one by Paul Zweig. I do not want to write a book of traditional literary criticism because th there are plenty of those. I wanted to make something more personal that looked at intersections between my obsessions and Whitman's, looked at the ways that my life has been changed by his work that I, I feel he presides, he resides as a spirit, as a presence. And so uh, these sections about him are interleaved, as it were, with bits of memoir. And so I'm just gonna read you a little bit from that same chapter about uh, an early experience as a sort of developing, searching writer. And uh, some of you will recognize the poet William Eberson, who appears in here. He's also known as Brother Antoninus, uh, uh, one of the beat poets who was um, especially uh, theatrical and dramatic. He had been a, I think, a Carthusian, or I can't remember, uh, I'll find it in the text. Um, what order he belonged to, but he left in order to um, celebrate creation in different ways. Primarily sex, I think. Okay, when I was 25, I went to a writer's conference, my first on the California coast, on an identic Santa Cruz campus of yellow grassland pouring down the slopes to the sea. There were workshops and readings and a good deal of staying up so one could drink no more, convivial nights of long talks, most often about our wish to become ourselves as writers, whatever that might mean, about longing, our deep desire to feel complete, real to ourselves. I made a raft of friends, a lean and intense fiction writer trying to find her way inside a novel that eluded her, the West Coast editor of Playgirl, a joyful zoftic beauty who wore metallic caftans and shared with me her delicious slender little cigars. It was 1978. I was still married and secretive about my longing for men, but I had a mad crush on a warm, bearish man whose every gesture seemed to spread sweetness and good humor. Like the Playgirl editor, he occupied space with notable delight in being a body. Toward the end of the gathering, he told me, in an embrace flush with wine and heat, that if he hadn't been having an affair with the woman across the hall from my room, he'd have been with me. That would have been possible? I was dazed, so happy with the idea that such a thing could have happened, I honestly didn't mind so much that it hadn't. There was another set of events, too, richer and stranger. The poet William Everson, the elder animating spirit of the place, who had once been Brother Antoninus, a Dominican monk who renounced the order to pursue both art and pleasure, offered a series of meditative lectures, a loosely structured performance over several mornings called The Birth of a Poet. At an hour on the early side for apprentice writers, still groggy, we would troop down the hill toward a space deemed conducive to inwardness, 
Could it really have been called the Kiva? Or have I made that up? Have I invented it the way I've invented Walt Whitman's wide awake straw in that splendid Brooklyn spring? Erithan himself was Whitmanic, streaming white hair, generous beard and eyebrows to match. He wore old jeans and a shirrell and vest over his white shirt. Fleece turned inward against a coastal damp, the leather beaded and sketched in dark lines with animals and stars. It had been given to him, he said, by his friends among the coyotes. In one of the two pockets in front resided a smallish bottle, a pint of the Jack Daniels. He would not be with that. Much of what he said, I've forgotten. Certainly he described his spiritual education, how the calling to the monastic life and the calling to poetry were in fact the same thing, perhaps misheard at first, understood differently over time. He talked about his hero, Robinson Jeffers, the great poet of that coastline, a fierce and lonely man with a touch of granite both in his profile and the chill around his heart, who lashed out his own species and wrote of beautiful hurt hawks because he could not bear the pain we inflict on one another or the injury that must have been done to him. As great poets do, he found a way to transform <laughs> you. As great poets do, he found a way to transmute the personal wound into something larger. His rejection of human company became a way to love stone and wind and time. The grand elemental forces made visible on the bluff in Carmel where he built his own stone tower of a house. The surf and stones of Big Sur, if not larger than time or quite outside of it, were of a scale commensurate with the ages. I used to think I would never take pleasure in imagining the earth after the end of the sun. But as the damage we've done goes clearer every day, I find myself in greater sympathy with Jeffers' position. His poems take comfort in the world going on without us, our petty scrawlings on the face of the planet all swept away. Even his stone tower? Probably. Like Whitman, Everson was also a printer. He told us about his printing press, the cold metal of it, the way setting type brought one closer to the body of the poem, how he had made an edition of Jeffers' poems, each copy housed in a case of Monterey Cypress, into the cover of which he'd inlaid a polished square of granite from Tor House itself. Many sips of whiskey between all this, pauses while Everson waited for the next thread to come clear, a little shuffling, circling dance, some coughs and pacing, a sip of whiskey, and in a while, a new direction emerging from the last. Here is what he said that I've never forgotten. The movement of the soul is vertical, he claimed, descending into the world. And when we become incarnate, as Christ the model and exemplar of the human form did, then our vertical motion intersects with time, with the horizontality of the temporal world. When a book is made then, the life of the maker is nailed, he said, to the intersection of those two lines. In the book, he said, the self is fixed, made concrete. The book is the intersection of the soul and time. So uh, you might begin to see there how uh, some very different kinds of thinking and different kinds of uh, focus uh, will come together for patient readers who are, are willing to divigate in this way. Um, I identify in the book five sources for, for Whitman's poems. Um, and I think it is sort of worthwhile as a project because it was really one of the great mysteries in you know, American letters, how this happened. We know that in the 1840s, he heard Emerson give a lecture in New York City. It was an early version of Emerson's essay, The Poet, that called for an American bard, someone with the kind of capacity of our continent, a poetry commensurate with this new world that would let go of old European ways of making. Uh, nobody had written those poems. Emerson and, and Walt first heard this lecture and was just set on fire by it. He, he wanted to be that poet. And of course, it's to Emerson that in very, one of the very early copies of the first edition of Leaves of Grass went. What a strange book it was. Coffee table size, uh, gold stamped uh, roots and plants on the cover, spelling out the words Leaves of Grass. You open it, there's a picture. It's an engraving of the poet who is standing with one hand on his hip and he's kind of looking at you a little sideways, his head cocked, he's got a slouchy hat on. Famously, his undershirt is showing underneath his open collar. 19th century readers expected a poet to um, be saying you know, something a little bit more like this, you know, except with a, a bust of some you know, Latin poet here and a waistcoat and very formally dressed. Uh, Whitman says, here I am. And it's a, it's a kind of challenging position. It looks like he's saying, you know, yeah, you deal with this reader, here I am. He does not put his name on the front piece in the book. Can you imagine you self-publish your own book of poems and you don't put your name on it? 
there's a tiny, tiny next little, little copyright page, you know, which is Walter Whitman is the owner of these works. Otherwise, you have to read the entire preface and about uh, 15 pages or so into Song of Myself to define his name. I, Walt Whitman, a cosmos, one of the, I, Walt Whitman, a rough, uh, one of the roughs, the cosmos of Manhattan, the sun. What a strange thing to do. Years later, his secretary, helper, Horace Traubel said, why did you do that? And Walt, as an old man, said, well, it would have been like putting a name on the universe. And he believed that, that this great encyclopedic poem was, it really sort of, he co-authored it. It, it. it poured through him. It emerged. He said that his early poems were written in a kind of trance that he could never will himself to return to. And that's one of the reasons that those early poems have an authority, a force, uh, that a little later. Okay, that's quite enough. We know you're there. Okay, you want to come over here? Yeah. Those early poems have a great force that the later ones lack. I do not say that Whitman just declined. He was always an une uneven poet. He would write a magnificent poem, like Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, and two days later he would write a, song, a poem like Song of the Broad Axe, which is a, a, a hymn to uh, cutting down the forest and subduing Native Americans, you know? And, and it's, it, really, a cliched poem would come right after something with extraordinary originality. It's hard to understand that, except that he was driven early on by a creative fire. He needed to work, and he understood that he was making something uniquely American that he, he didn't think of it in the way that most poets conceive their work. I think we tend to, if we're making poems that are expressions of personal feeling, we hope people will find them, make use of them. Who believes that the poems you write will change the world? He did. He said later that he wished he had been an orator instead of a poet, because he would have influenced more people that way by giving speeches. Interesting you know, point of view, that his purpose was to change how we live and how we think about ourselves. He mounted a full tilt assault on the idea that we are discrete individuals held apart from each other in our separate sacks of skin. And he believed that at its core, the self is sort of something we hold in common. There is a mutuality about it. He believed that we could found a social order, a true democracy, based upon our affection for each other. Um, erotic, familial, uh, the affection of friendship, all that together could remake the world in which we find ourselves. That's a tall order for Tom to do. And if you look at, after he did that first edition, his second edition, which he published a year later, uh, without probably selling any of the first edition at all, he just had more poems to put in it, it's changed in its shape. Now, the book is about this big, it's very thick, and it's designed to fit in the pocket of your work jacket. So you can take it with you everywhere. You can read it outdoors. He actually advises that it, it would be a good idea to read Leaves of Grass Naked outside once a year. You know, great. Um, yeah, and it will, it will guide you and lead you forward. Uh, it's a beautiful ambition. It, it's obviously uh, a doomed one, uh, particularly when you think about what came just a few years later. If he published his first edition in 1855, it's not very far until 1860 when the real clouds of the Civil War uh, darken, when people, uh, the young men of Brooklyn are marching off to fight in the South. And instead of seeing the young embrace one another out of common affection, he sees them tearing each other apart. And it must have been enormously painful to him to not feel that that vision could become real. He understood later on that his America, he said this to Horace, was something that never existed. He knew it didn't exist. It was, it was an ideal, it was a possibility. And for him, it was always something he was inscribing on the edge of time so that we might get there. Um, he was not naive, he was very hopeful. He was naive about one thing, which is that he believed that he could be both a sexual radical, writing the, just the most homoerotic poems in forever, also writing poems that were decidedly feminist, that granted women sexual desire, independence, uh, uh, will, intelligence, you know, uh, and also write poems that were distinctly anti-racist in his first editions, and think that he could be a spiritual leader too, or a national leader. So he, he wanted to be a sage, he wanted to be loved, and he wanted to be a radical. It's really hard to pull that one off. You know, I think in this country, 
we, we like our radicals, but we don't put them in charge, you know? And the people in charge, we want a certain kind of conservatism out of them. You know, so there, there's a, a battle going on in him. He would bend over backwards to be liked. He would write poems like, oh, Captain, my Captain, you know, which is a, a, the most popular poem he wrote in his lifetime. It's a very Victorian, rhymed and metered ode to President Lincoln. It's just awful, right? And at the same time, he would write uh, When Lionel's Last in the Dooryard Bloom, which is a masterpiece of an elegy to the same person. These conflicting impulses uh, were with him all his life, and they are one of the things that very much made him himself. He was a New Yorker, and therefore he was a self-promoter, and he was not shy, and he, he liked to shine, you know, and he liked to hold the crowd's attention. Um, and he was very much a man of his times. This is the era that gave us marketing. There's a famous story about Whitman being photographed with a butterfly on his finger. And he, he said to, to Horace, said, you know, oh, you know, animals really like me. And it was coming, and we were talking, and it was visiting often. The butterfly was made of cardboard. And it's in, <laughs> it's in the, um, I think it's the New York Public Library now, collection, the Bird Collection. You know, it's, it's made for some commercial products, got printing on it. But he was not above passing this off as real. So I quote a character, a real visionary who was also, um, you know, a, a, a salesman. And I can just go right on and on. How long have we been talking here? How are we doing? <laughs> oh, um, maybe this is, uh, uh, you know, we can go anywhere with this conversation. And maybe that would be the thing to do. We can turn to your questions, and, and that can be a way for us to move towards completion. Yeah. Open some doors, I hope. Great. So why don't we just invite folks to put a question in the chat. And while folks are doing that, I just want to let you know, Mark, about uh, so where people are joining us from. So we have Jessica from Bucks County, uh, Ellen from White Plains. We have Carol Ann from the Adirondacks, uh, Cameron from Long Island, Charles from First Avenue and 23rd Street, uh, Sarah from Ithaca, and Rachel is here from, uh, Liz, uh, from New York City. Uh, Caitlin Shays from the Whitman Center out here on Long Island. So that's welcome uh, to Caitlin. We have Columbus, Ohio, South Carolina, Huntington, New Jersey, Southeast Pennsylvania. Um, Toronto. Toronto is here. Okay. Seattle, Washington. So coast to coast, coast to coast. So what well, people may be considering questions. I do have one that was uh, emailed to me just shortly ago from Jonathan Sillen. And if you give me a moment, I'll just grab that and read it out to you. If I can find it. I hope it'd be a uh, little yips were not too distracting. Oh no, it was fun. It was delightful. It's great. Hard person, yeah. Um, well, I don't see it here. So perhaps, um, Jonathan, if you're out there, if you want to unmute yourself. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Um, I'm under David Townsend. There we go. Hi. Um, I was uh, really impressed by the way in the book that you parsed um, the shifts in some of uh, Whitman's poems from an earlier version, which was much more homoerotic and much more radical to the branded version that was much more about being all American. And um, your, your line by line analysis was really uh, amazing and I had no idea about that. So I was just wondering if you could say a bit more about that and how you understand that personally, because obviously you've got a great personal connection to Whitman, a deep connection. And how did you make your peace with this two sides of him? Well, I can't blame him for any of this because <laughs> I expected him to have written more radical poems than he did. If he wrote poems that were entirely basically unreadable to his audience, which a, a pure open declaration of same-sex love would have been, we probably wouldn't know them. We probably wouldn't exist. You know, he, they have been writable and suitable to audiences because in a way they were tempered, but you can still read between the lines. And we have to think about what was going on in those times. You know, the 1840s were, in which he's coming of age is a time of experimentation, social freedom, all these self-help movements are invented 
with the notion or based on the notion that human beings are perfectible, that you can get better through your diet, your exercise, your, your feminism, your nude sunbathing, your uh, communal living, your reading of newly translated texts from Asia, like the Upanishads or Bhagavad Gita. You know, we, this was a national program and fascination, especially in the East Coast. How much of America was there besides the East Coast? And Asia, but, uh, this is a fascination that shaped him. And then something really shifts with the war and movements that are happening at the same time with the development, the, psych the psychologizing, the medicalization of personality. Psychology became enormously interested in defining the abnormal in order to sort of fence off what was acceptable and appropriate. And the first place it goes is towards sexuality. So the word homosexual appears in print for the first time in the 1880s. The word heterosexual is in print for the 1890s. So the, those words, split the universe in half, basically, the human universe, into these two binaries. You can be X or you can be Y. And once we said that, then there's an anxiety about which one are you and how you identify with it. When Whitman was first writing, sex seems to have been, it's very hard to conceive of this, because we're all saturated in this binary. It is part of our conceptual framework for the world. But it was not always the case. So there was a time when people could have behaviors and did not give them an identity. So for instance, um, I talk in the book about this bar, downtown Manhattan, where men dressed as women, they were called fairies, and you could go there and you'd pay a nickel or something, and then you could dance with a fairy. If you danced with a fairy, it didn't mean you were one. And the fairies were only fairies when they were in there, in their dresses, dancing with men. So it was a kind of um, space of performance, which was seemed to be a pleasure that people enjoyed, but it did not say who you were. Luke Tom, in his great book, uh, Low Life, talks about a guidebook <laughs> for Manhattan, which lists sites of particular kinds of vice very specifically so you could avoid those, you know, if you might be tempted. <laughs> so, you know, there's a bar where, you know, you can meet very young boys there, uh, you know, places where Asian women <laughs> are often, and so on, and so on. And this helps out. Yeah. So, it gets really complicated trying to sort that out, you know? I mentioned a review, one of the first reviews of Lisa Grass, 1855, by a monstrous critic named Rufus Griswold, who was quite powerful in that time. He was a big anthologist, and so the poets that he included in his anthologies had readers, and the poems, the poems that he didn't often did not. So he reviewed Lisa Grass. He said it was stupid filth, and that um, you know, a donkey in love could have maybe written these poems. <laughs> And he concludes his review by saying, and readers should be warned that there is a whiff there of, of something that I just, we just really can't name in this newspaper. Um, and he says, it is the, in Latin, the sin that is not to be named among Christians, okay? which is sodomy. Okay? Now, but he says in Latin, how many readers of, you know, like the New York Herald Examiner knew Latin and would have been able to understand that this was a prohibition against sodomy? Is he warning the reader or advertising the book? It's hard to tell. You know? So that kind of murkiness goes on all the time. Um, it became increasingly less murky as time went on. So that, you know, Whitman dies early, uh, what is it, early, like three years maybe before the Oscar Wilde trial. But that's in the air. And that moment of international scandal, shaming, huge public attention to an invert to wireless of terrible, terrible misbehavior. He's cheating on his wife, he has children at home. He's a successful artist and he has this life where he's having sex with these low lives. And, and what happens to him, this enormous man is put in a tiny, tiny cell and basically worked to death. You know, he has to climb, like a stairman, he has to climb stairs that are always turning, uh, conveyor belts so they break rocks. He does that for two or three years. He's a ruined man, dies not so long after. That event, I think, crystallized what it meant to be queer. And it created the figure of the pariah in a way that uh, will be quite familiar to those of us who uh, lived in America before Free Stonewall, you know, and even, you know, after, or in some places now, you know. The world has changed enormously in our lifetimes, and that's a thrilling thing. Um, but 
the process of evolution from say 1855 till 2020 is absolutely extraordinary. How many definitions have changed? It, it leads me to think that this is always true of sexuality. Desire doesn't change. People didn't invent a whole bunch of new sexual practices in 1855, you know, or in 1890, but the way we think about it changes and continues to. So, you know, maybe as readers, you've got to read the historical lens to try to pay attention to that and think about what, what you're being told. Because it is the ability to study this and to think about it is actually relatively recent, right? I've been around much. Yeah. It's Wonderful, Mark, you know, to contextualize the fact that in 2020 things are so much different than even they were 10 years ago. Uh, we have a question in the chat from Audrey Friedman. Hey, Audrey. When you are deeply in love with the works of a mentor, you find him or her invading, in quotes, your own work. Are there poems of yours that Whitman has, quote unquote, spoken in? Well, I, d I don't think I sound like him. Uh, she's, she's quite distinctive, and I hope I don't. It's very distinctive cadences. His attention to being part of the group and his pleasure in that is, I think, a really tonic influence to me. I mean, I, I, I grew up feeling like, A, I, I was the only, the only gay boy in Tucson, Arizona, and, which was clearly an illusion, you know, and, and B, that um, I had feelings, insights, daydreams that were utterly incomprehensible to other people. Nobody felt like I did. That was just not true. And Whitman helps us to know that you're always in connect, you're always connected, you know? He said, it's remarkable, he says, just as you were one of a crowd, I was one of a crowd. And when he says, I was one of a crowd, he's 35, 36 years old when he's writing that, but he's writing when he's already dead. You know, history has moved on and I was one of a living crowd. It's so important to him to feel that he is not isolate, but part of the, the great flashing school of human beings. I think that's partly to do with his recognition of a profound difference, you know, which was unspoken. I think for him, his homosexuality was an identity. It, and he may be the first such person, who, at least the first one who wrote about it. I think he is an early example of the urban queer citizen. And he, he fulfills that role, at least early in his life, you know, with great gusto and energy. <coughs> so, yeah. So we have another question from David who asks, what were some of your top biographical sources when researching Whitman's life? Sure. Uh, Paul's wife's biography, which is called Walt Whitman Making of a Poet, is superb. It only covers the years when he's uh, about to publish the book and a few years after. So it's concerned with the writing of, of the first edition and his thinking and his friendships at that time. It's uh, brilliantly empathic. Uh, he just gets it. And he also does not, he, he just, his book was published in the 70s and he says that Whitman, you know, is obviously a lover of men. There's just no bones about it, you know, so to speak. So uh, that's a great relief because to this day, there are biographers who, who kind of jump over hoops. Um, David Reynolds, who is a terrific writer who produced a wonderful book called What Women's America, uh, that tells you all about what was going on in New York and in the culture in the 1840s, 1850s. Fascinating book. Um, turns somersaults to say that Whitman is not gay because you can't really use that term. He's not this, he's not that. And what about passionate friendship? And it's not, 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 you know, for pages and pages. Who, who, who needs this kind of apology, right? I mean, what's the hemming and hawing about? Um, it seems to me that the poet gave us very direct evidence of how he felt. But Evidence is a really weird thing when it comes to that kind of personal history, because there is no evidence of people's sexuality, but how, where would you find that, right? People leave traces, suggestions, possibilities, texts of feeling, but they, there's no real historical record. So it's always gonna be the case. What was, it, what was the question? Oh, sources, okay. Um, so there's lots of really interesting uh, critical stuff on Whitman, uh, Michael Moon, a really terrific scholar who, put together the manuscript of, uh, uh, I saw in Louisiana, Live Oak Growing, which was originally a sequence that Whitman broke up and moved around in Calamus to make it a little less autobiographical. A uh, really good writer. Uh, Charlie Shively, who's an early sort of uh, gay liberation scholar, has a book called Calamus Lovers. I think it's terrific. I learned a lot from it. Um, 
going to places associated with Whitman, going to his house, um, not the one in Huntington so much, which is a beautiful house that you know he left there when he was four or five years old, but the house in um, Caldwell, New Jersey, Caldwell, um, Camden, New Jersey, is marvelous, and it's a real repository of stuff. Also, getting your, just getting your hands on some of the papers, uh, it's hard to get to touch them anymore because they're understandably protected, but University of Virginia Library and the New York Public Library has wonderful collections of letters, documents, all kinds of stuff. And going to the Library of Congress was so thrilling to me because they, they want to help you. They, they love people who love books. So, you know, a, a lovely librarian went and got me every first edition of Lazy Grass and just brought them and set them next to me that I thought I was just going to faint. You know, I was, I was there all day with these books. Like holy ground. You know? oh, that sounds marvelous. Wow, a dream come true for you. Yeah. So um, we have another question, uh, you know, ironically talking about Whitman's sexuality, being a homosexual. From Pamela, she asks, what makes Whitman a quintessentially American voice? Ah, uh, good question. Uh, well, for one thing, he's really committed to American speech. And there are many, many words throughout Lazy Grass, and especially in Song Myself, which simply did not appear in poetry in English before him. Um, and they, they seem natural to us because he made them so. So a word like luckier. Luckier does not show up in Wordsworth. Luckier is not in anybody else until that moment. Uh, Whitman says he, he doesn't go with those who think life is but a suck and a sell. A suck and a sell? How, more, how American can you get, right? That's, again, not going to show up in the romantic poets whom Whitman was reading. Um, let's see. Oh, words like, uh, you know, even things that are not American in the derivation, he makes them sound that way. I sound my barbaric yawp over the rooftops of the world. Yawp is a Middle English word, but somehow I sound my barbaric yawp. It's just like, it, it's attitude of Americanness. Um, he likes trades too. He's very interested in carpentry and the things that people make. In early in the 1850s, up where Bryant Park is now, was a crystal palace. It was one of these great, you know, iron and glass structures that were very extremely possible because of new technology. And it held an exhibition of the industry of humankind. Anything that people made ever was on display. So you could look at uh, pottery, industrial crafts, metalwork, uh, fine arts. There were dinosaur bones. You know, you name all, and he studied anything. And Whitman would go through there with his little green notebooks writing down words. And this is why you get passages like, you know, I find I incorporate nice and, and uh, escalant, and I, I am stuckled all over with quadrupeds and birds. You know, he's describing himself as a universal being. Lots of terms that come from sciences. He, there's stuff about dinosaurs in some of myself, stuff about evolution. Also, uh, astronomy, uh, astronomy rather, study of, of planetary motions and orbits. Uh, he talks about going to hear a tenor sing. Italian opera was something he just loved. Uh, and it was very popular in New York in his day. And he said that he's spun around like some, he compares himself to Uranus, being, being spun around by the voice of the tenor you know, in the hall as he's listening. So you know, the broad range of reference is the result of his saturation in American speech, in a different vocabulary. Yeah. Also, American people had not used um, uh, uh, Tallahassee, Scalmucci, you know, the names of rivers and places that came out of Native American uh, you know, nomination. So that's a really refreshing thing. In the book, I quote, uh, and somebody just took me to task for this. They said I set him up as a straw dog. I have a poem of Thoreau's. And Thoreau was a magnificent prose writer, but he was not a very good poet. And in his poem, he is, it's called The Thaw. And he's describing wishing that he could thaw like some ice by the side of the road in spring and flow through the veins of nature. But um, it's a terrible poem because it's primarily, it's so stiff. It is straitjacketed by rhyme and meter. Whitman takes that same kind of idea, the wish to merge, and puts it in a, a colloquial syntax he uses a version of American speech, which is dramatic and repetitive, has cadences that come mostly out of the King James Bible, in his poems anyway. Uh, and because American speech was inflected by scripture too. It was very much, you know, part of what shaped us, as did Shakespeare. So all that, you know, now, of course, it would, we have other ways of entertaining ourselves. 
But remember the 19th century, people read at home at night because that's what you could do. And every household pretty much had a Bible, a complete Shakespeare, and Paradise Lost. So we could count on people being informed by those influences, which were pretty splendid rhetorical influences. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mark. We have a number of other questions coming up here. I see that Sally Greenhouse has a couple of threads here. In your research, did you come across the only TV show in which Whitman was written into the storyline? It became highly controversial in the 1990s. Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, mm -hmm. uh, fictionally taking place in Colorado Springs when Jane Alexander as Dr. Quinn explains to her son why everyone is gossiping about his special friendship with Walt and that he should ignore their name calling and continue going uh, on nature walks together. Um, have, essays have been written about it. Any, any comment, any, haven't heard of that? Okay, something, something to look, look, into, look into later. Mark, you've got to see it. You've yeah. got to see it. I do know about um, Whitman appears in um, Michael Cunningham's um, which novel is that the three parts? It, it's not after the hours. And there's a section about Whitman, which I, I honestly don't like very much. I, I didn't buy it. Um, let's see. I read a few novels in which he shows up, but I've never been satisfied by them. I think he's a very hard character to catch both his humor, his slyness, and his brilliance, you know, and, and, the, and the compassion that he has. So there's a lot of dimensions to this man. I think he's a difficult character to portray in fiction. Okay, so we have a question from Caitlin at the Whitman uh, Center, Walt Whitman Place. She says that Whitman seems to have an epiphany of sorts before he wrote Leaves of Grass. Uh, what do you think led him to think and write so differently at that point in his life? I think this is one of the, the sources of his great work, that something happened to him. That something was probably informed by what he was reading. We know he read the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and was very interested in uh, different kinds of thinking, philosophical bases or theological bases of thinking about the self and about personality. But I think he had an experience. And the experience of that is, the closest thing we have to a record of it is very early on in Song of Myself when he describes an erotic encounter on the grass on a transparent summer morning. And the way he sets it up, he's kind of suggesting that these encounters with his own soul but, you know, he uses one of the slippery stanza breaks of his, so you don't really know if the person that he's talking about in the first stanza is the same one he's talking about the second stanza or not. But he says that you, whoever you are, uh, placed his or her face on his lap, put one hand to his beard and one hand to his feet, and then they proceeded to make love. And he says, swiftly arose around me the peace and understanding that passes all knowledge of earth, or is it all peace and knowledge that passes all understanding of earth. And he goes on this beautiful stanza in which he describes being elevated by this experience of communion. This is um, a classic description of a kind of peak experience because what happens in those seems to be that the boundary between self and other dissolves. So there he is having this ecstatic lovemaking and suddenly he understands that he doesn't stop at his own skin and he feels connected to everything. So he shows, I know that the hand of God is the elder hand of my own. Elder hand, what an extraordinary word. Uh, I, I know that the men and women are, uh, he says, are my, oh, my brothers and lovers. He says, and a kelson of the creation is love. The kelson is the big wooden beam that holds a wooden ship together. So if the kelson of the creation is love, that means the creation is con uh, continuous, constructed, it means it's going somewhere, a boat is heading forward, and that it's held together by, by our love for each other, by the world's love for us and our love for it. He goes on then, amazingly, to extend that warmth of that vision down to the little stones and the mossy scabs and the sticks on the ground. If he ended on this great rhetorical note, I wouldn't believe him as much, but because his sense of great compassion and connection spills over to the smallest objects, it's just utterly convincing to me. So I, I think he um, had the kind of experience that might be described as um, en route to enlightenment, uh, as a peak experience, a mystical experience, you know, whatever you want to call it. I don't think those are rare. Um, it, it seems to me that uh, many people and certainly many artists have experiences that, that are given to us that, that are ones in which we feel the boundary dissolve and we feel our sense of connectedness 
the real largeness of our cells. Um, yeah. Great. Very much because we don't have much of a vocabulary for them, right? And because it's hard to carry that experience on in your daily life. You know, it, it's hard to, uh, when you go to the bank, you may not remember that you and the banker are of the same fabric or not. You know, it, it's a different kind of operation we do in our daily lives. But I think he was transformed by that. I think he's also transformed by the language of America in that moment, by um, his, his incredible sexual experience, which gave him an outsider's perspective onto the culture. You know, he was always seeing things slightly askew um, by his deep fascination with death um, and by his love of New York City. You know, before Whitman, poets are trashing cities right and left. Wordsworth couldn't stand the city. Blake, you know, I'm marking every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. Whitman is the first poet to just say, woof, New York, yeah. Uh, he, he's saying, uh, you know, what rewards me in New York? Continual lovers always reward me. He's always, he loves cruising, he loves looking at people, he loves riding stagecoaches up and down Broadway and seeing what's in the shop windows. And that's a, a precedent that he creates for Hart Crane and then for Frank O'Hara, who after him are poets in great embrace and delight in the city and its uh, randomness, you know, its opportunities, its, its surprises, flashes. Wonderful. Thank you. And I mean, that time period in American history, there were many writers coming to the fore, unlike before, and, and that we still read today. Um, Whitman one being one of them. So, yeah. We have a question from Sarah White. Maybe this should be the last one. We'll see how, how we go. Uh, I might need some help from her because let me read it to you and Sarah, you can, uh, if you unmute yourself, say if this is clear. Can you tell us something about Whitman and one of your own poems? Yeah, yeah. So I don't know, if, Sally, are you still with us? I mean, excuse me, Sarah? You're muted. Oh, I am? Yeah, okay, uh, go. Now, now, you're, now you're on, please, is that, Complete. Yes, that's that's what I said. I, okay. I just said uh, some presence of Whitman in a poem of Marx. Yeah, I, I don't. Well, I, I can I can tell you. This is not going to be a direct story about Whitman, but but it's an analogous story. I, I have a poem. Uh, it's in um, Deep Lane. It's called The King of Fire Island. It's a poem about a wounded deer that I had a relationship with. That was um, difficult, the painful one. Uh, I love this deer and did not survive. And I wrote this poem as a kind of straight up narrative. And I carried that narrative around for uh, almost two years. It didn't have an ending. I just didn't, didn't know what to do with it. The story was, was not the poem. And I was sitting in a, my favorite cafe in the city, place I like to go and write, back in the day when you do that. And um, I looked at that poem, the computer file, and I suddenly thought, what would Stanley do with this? Stealing Cunits, I was thinking of, who, who has been that kind of figure for me, a, a person of enormous courage, and uh, of, oh, yeah, he was sort of, he would follow an impulse anywhere if he had to, you know, to, to get the poem, to catch the poem whole, he was willing to go where he didn't know, he was willing to go places that frightened him, he, he understood that as being the artist's imperative, really, and, and I finished the poem. And I was sitting there, I mean, I mean, it was so crazy because I was sitting there with the tears streaming down my face. I mean, finished this poem in this coffee shop and I look up and there's Marie House, you know, right? who was also there having coffee. And it was like, she got, you know, she understood what had happened. It was an amazing moment. But I think what, what our models of great poets do for us is, is to instill courage. You know? And Whitman's marvelous for that. You think he is willing to take these strides and to make, um, to make a claim on reality, who else is, is you know, who is American poet is willing to talk about ontology in there? Like, what does it mean to be you? You know, what do you make of that? That's just remarkable that he could do that with claim this authority. Um, and that's something that we, we get from Dickinson. It's something we get from Wilta, you know, from, from great poets who are willing to wrestle experience to the ground in the search of some kind of understanding. So, so it's, 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 it's an intangible, but it's very real. In a way, it's the poem sets the bar and says, that's, what, that's what's possible. 
Okay, so if that's what's possible, are you going to just are you just going to describe this deer when you could get there? Maybe you try to get there. Wonderful, Thank you. wonderful, Mark. Listen, this is great. We're we're well over our, our time period. I think we've gotten to most of the questions in the chat. Uh, just our deep thanks to you for your presence, for your wonderful work, and for bringing Whitman into the into the room today, and and his uh, the impression that he's left um, within you. I, I'd like to unmute everybody so we can actually give a nice round of applause and hear huzzas to uh, to Mark for the work. So I think you're all unmuted. Um, not yet. Not yet. Okay, hang on a second. Coming. Awesome, Mark. It's just beautiful. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Great collaboration with you and Ned. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, well done. Well done. Really, really, really appreciate it. Yeah. That would be great. Yes. Great. You can, we'll put in the, you know, email us, call us, come and see us. Great. You do curbside? Uh, we do indeed. Yeah. We do curbside, yeah. We, we actually, we, people can come in the store now. We're in phase two out on the East End now. Well, we have phase one here, I believe. Yeah. But phase one is just like a relief. People are stirring more. Yeah. That's Finally, great. right? What a long, long time it must have been for you to be in that apartment. Oh, yeah. I am going to Hudson next week for a week. I'm so happy. I have not been out of this apartment except in the <laughs> months. Uh, Hudson. Yeah. Well, Mark, I just want to say the, the book is just an absolutely exquisite experience. And I am so delighted to have it here on the shelf after you'd been mentioning it and talking about it some time back, a while back, who can remember? But um, it's just a, a gorgeous book to just fall into and live in. And it's just um, extraordinary. You know, I love what you did with, with Whitman's use of the pronoun you. I, I just think that's so, so fantastic. Anyway, I just wanted to say it's, it's wonderful. Thank you. And yeah, I just want to... I want to toss something in. I'm sorry, Marianne, to step on your uh, last few words Go there. But, you know, to everyone who's still on the chat, you know, this is a, a challenging time for a writer to bring a book into the marketplace with the, the COVID crisis. So we really need to support Mark. We want you all to go out, tell your friends to get the book, buy a couple of copies and give us gifts to anyone you know who is interested in Whitman, interested in the subjects that Mark raised tonight. We need to help uh, spread the, the good news about this good book and and get that get it out in the market. So, you know, just want to acknowledge, Mark, how, how challenging it is at this particular moment. Thank you, Catherine. It felt so strange to not be able to go in a bookstore and, and see a stack of it and sign and sign. And also, all you know, these events, which are wonderful, I keep having the feeling that I'm watching it through the wrong end of the telescope, that, that my book <laughs> is out there somewhere. And it's hard to feel the kind of visceral connection that, that one is used to. Nonetheless, I mean, responses from people have been so lovely and so gratifying. Sure. You know, the, the people who tell me that it was one of the only books they could read now in, in this time of, of stress and fragmentation, and that's, that's amazing. That's a lot. I wouldn't have expected that. That's really wonderful. That's really wonderful. So everyone, thank you for joining thank us. You. It's great to see, you know, David and Jonathan and Monica and all of, you know, our Bard people out there we haven't been able to see and some lovely other faces we recognize. Thanks for being here. I'll be in soon. Great, Monica. And a shout out to Martha in Bristol, Rhode Island. Welcome. Hello. Welcome to Canios. Where are you? I can't see her. She's hiding, but that's all right. <laughs> Thank you again, Mark. It was wonderful. You, Mark. You're welcome. It's You're welcome. the ideal quarantine book. Great. Great.